Welcome, everybody. My name is Tommy Soares. I'm Assistant Director of the Purdue Institute of Inflammation, Immunology, and Infectious Disease. And today on the Purdue Lecture Hall series, I have the pleasure of welcoming Isaiah Mensa from the Department of Biochemistry, working with Humaira Gower's group and working on some really, really interesting uh, work that is not uh, necessarily the traditional genetics that people know about. And I am so excited that you're here to tell us a little bit about this world of epigenetics. And I'm excited to hear your story too, Isaiah, because I know that you're originally from Ghana. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. So uh, we want to hear it all as far as you want to take us back to uh, <laughs> tell us about your journey and tell us about your research. Um, what I'm going to do as typical, I'll turn myself off. You can go ahead, share your screen and welcome. Thank you again, Isaiah, for doing this uh, for us and educating us about your adventure in life. Thank you. Um, let me try and share my screen. Okay. Looking great. Nice flower. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, I'll start the presentation. Thank okay. you so much, Dr. Sauce, for uh, that awesome introduction. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be with you uh, this morning to talk about what I do and also to talk a little bit about myself. And I hope that I can uh, encourage uh, the younger generation of uh, scientists uh, to pursue science. And, and who knows, we will be able to move the boundaries uh, of science as it is. Um, I titled my talk, uh, Investigating Pathways That Control the Development of Heart Cells. Uh, and I, I do this work primarily in Dr. Humira Gawa's lab. Uh, but before I go into any of that, I would like to talk a little bit about myself, where I'm from, and how I got here. So I was born in Ghana, uh, West Africa. So that is where this pain is located. It's on the West Africa part, of, uh, West part of uh, the African continent. Uh, this is our flag. So if you see this flag somewhere after today, uh, hopefully you will think of me. Uh, so I, I put this flag here because it's it's really symbolic of, of the country and the type of people that we are. And everything here has a meaning, right? So uh, red standing for the, the toil and, and the blood that was shed uh, by our ancestors to, to gain independence, the yellow uh, representing gold and the mineral resources. So Ghana is very rich in mineral resources. And then you have the green, which, which talks about the rich vegetation and agriculture that uh, the country has. And of course, there is the, the black star, which talks about uh, promotes black excellence as, as it were. And this is the coat of arms of, of the country. And, uh, Again, I show it because Ghana is a, a country that believes strongly in freedom and justice. And then I put it here. Uh, so like many other countries, Ghana is one of those countries where a lot of freedom is, is being exercised. So a lot of people, when, when you think of Africa, uh, sometimes, I, I'm not imposing this on anybody, but uh, sometimes this is the image that people have about Africa and, and Ghana, as it were, uh, talking about poverty and talking about civil unrest and out, I'll get my laser pointer, talking about civil unrest and talking about sanitation and all of that. Now, while some parts of Ghana are like this, uh, this is not the... Uh, this is not a status quo. The, Ghana is actually a very beautiful country. Uh, it's graced with uh, everything that you, you see in the West. So we have very beautiful landscapes. We have like the waterfalls. We have, we are surrounded by lakes. Uh, we have the Gulf of Guinea. We have like so many exotic animals. We have crocodiles. It's just a beautiful country. And 
if 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 you ever get a chance, you should visit Ghana. You truly enjoy it. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit more about Ghana. So Ghana is known for uh, producing cocoa. So uh, many of you, I'm sure, enjoy chocolate. And uh, to make chocolate, you need these cocoa beans. And Ghana is one of the leading, I think the second leading uh, producer of uh, an exporter of cocoa in the world, right? So it's possible that your chocolate bar may have some cocoa coming from Ghana. Uh, Ghana is also rich, uh, as I showed in the, the flag, the national flag in minerals, natural minerals, and gold is in abundance. Matter of fact, Ghana used to be called uh, the Gold Coast. So uh, because when, when the Europeans came into the country, they were just amazed by how much gold uh, the country had. And so here you see a king uh, being decorated in, in, in the gold. Now, uh, Ghana is also very rich in culture. So if, if you've ever met a Ghanaian, chances are you'd find out that they are very happy people. Uh, it's very patriotic people. And uh, you can see here, this is one of the festivals and you have people dressed up in attires that uh, emulate the, the Ghana national flag. And uh, it's just a lot of fun uh, in the country. Now we are huge, 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 huge uh, sport fanatics. And here you can see some, some Ghanaians showing their support for uh, the national uh, soccer team. And so when it comes to soccer, Ghanaians don't play with it. And, and it's one of the things I really like about Purdue because they have great fields that I can still play my soccer in, and, and I really appreciate that. Um, what Ghana is also known for is uh, independence. So Ghana was the first uh, African country to gain independence and, and paved the way for several other uh, African countries to gain independence. So over here, you can see the first president of Ghana uh, giving the declaration of independence uh, back in 1957. So this was uh, such an important date in African history and, and Ghana boasts of that being, being the first African country to lead uh, that front. Okay, so that's a crash course about Ghana right there. Uh, but I grew up in Accra. So Accra is the capital uh, city. And basically, it's it's very beautiful. It's It looks like most cities here. Um, but I did not grow up in the main beautiful part. I, I grew up from a much more humble beginning. So where I actually grew up is called Abokobi. And it looks uh, something like this. So this this is an image from just to give you a mental picture of how uh, the area in which I grew looked like. And uh, I didn't want to go far back into my life. I, I just wanted to begin from uh, where I did my junior high school. So I did my junior high school in a place called Elm Cluster of Schools. And it was it's very funny when I was going back to look at these pictures. So uh, the fun thing about Ellen is that it's really close to the market. So the market kept expanding and expanding and expanding and coming toward the school. And so sometimes you'd be in the classroom and you'd hear people uh, hawking and monging and talking about you know all the things they are selling and calling out on customers. It was it was such a fun time. There were a lot of distractions you could get from that, but you know uh, it, it was fun in, in retrospect looking back at you know how uh, my junior high school education was, and of course that's how I looked like when I was in junior high school. A uh, very young, innocent, excited uh, young boy. Um, and I show this here because this is truly when my scientific curiosity began without me even thinking of it. So at the time, I remember uh, we were cleaning up one of the lab spaces that we use for general lab practices. And uh, there were a lot of waste that they were going to throw away. And I remember taking some test tubes and a magnifying glass home. And at the time, I didn't know that I wanted to end up being a scientist or being in science and research. But I, would, I took these test tubes and the magnifying glass home and I would always boast with my, to my friends, 
showing them how I can use the magnifying glass to, you know, focus light to burn pieces of paper. And I'm sure a lot of uh, high school students who may be watching this would have done the same. But for me, that was that was when I actually started getting excited about science and what, what it has to offer. And so the way the Ghanaian, uh, the Ghana education system works is that um, once you complete junior high school, you need to select a course that you want to study in high school, right? So we don't have the general courses that you take. You, you either decide whether you want to study science, you want to study the arts, you want to study a vocational skill, and you have to make that decision really early on. And so uh, my parents seen how I like playing with test tubes and how I like uh, the magnifying glass and showing off to my friends and all of that. Uh, decided for me at the time. I I, I wasn't uh, smart enough to decide for myself, but I'm really happy they made that decision. So they decided I should go uh, study general science in high school. So that's what took me to uh, the Adda Secondary School. So still in the Greater Accra region, and and this is just one of the blocks uh, in in my high school. And I remember very clearly looking at these pictures. It was just so fun going back, looking at them. So this is exactly where my classroom was. And that was a science class. And it was it was just so much fun. And I really enjoyed my time there. But one thing I liked about Adar Secondary School was the motto, onward, ever onward. For me, it meant a lot. And it's something that I still keep till today, you know, the, the idea that you have to just keep going forward. There is no looking back. Just keep moving forward. And that is one thing that I really, really liked about Ada Secondary School. And the teachers at the time made sure to instill that motto in us. So we would always recite uh, uh, the motto uh, every morning before, before classes began. And one of the key players in my success uh, in high school was this man here. So he was an alumnus of the school at the time, uh, but he came back to teach chemistry. And so, and his, his Sir Marcus. So when he came back to teach, he was just going to teach for a year because in Ghana, when you complete college, you have to serve the country for a year in whatever capacity you see fit. And so he came back to teach chemistry. And that is, that was, an exciting moment for me because the way he taught chemistry just made chemistry an exciting topic to me. You know, he took his time and he explained every concept, whatever it was, no matter how difficult it was. He, he had an open door policy. He would run extra classes with us. And it was truly amazing how, how he changed a lot of uh, perceptions about chemistry because people used to be scared of chemistry uh, at the time. And, you know, after school, he would always come and encourage us, you know, to think big, to, to think in ways of changing the world. And uh, today he's a medical doctor. And I still, I'm still in contact with him. And he's one of the amazing people that I met. There were other amazing teachers like Schofield, Madame Ajo, and I cannot go through all the lists, but they all played very, very significant roles <clears throat> in, in my in my high school success. So from high school, really, I, I didn't have so much options. I knew at the time I wanted to go to the best college in the country, and that is the University of Ghana. So uh, over here on the top left panel is, is just uh, the entrance to the university. And this is the sky view of the university, very beautiful campus. And when I was a kid, my dad would always drive through uh, the University of Ghana campus, and it's the, it was the only place I wanted to be. I did not know what I wanted to study, but I was sure I wanted to be there. So I, I, I was very grateful to be uh, selected uh, to join the University of Ghana, and it was a really great time there. At that time, uh, I knew I did not want to study medicine because I... Medicine is such a cool profession and, you know, a lot of people who studied science at the time wanted to go into medicine and there were a lot of opportunities for medical doctors, but I, I, I just didn't feel like I could do medicine. 
it probably was because I didn't feel smart enough, but I also I felt like I needed to do something more. I, I I loved basics. I loved the fundamentals and how things worked. And so my dad at the time thought I should probably pursue engineering. Uh, but then uh, I met with other faculty at the University of Ghana at the time and, and described what I was really excited about. And also with the chemistry background that I had coming in from high school, um, they proposed I study biochemistry. And at the time, I, I wasn't sure if it's what I wanted to do, but it, it's, it turned out to be the best decision I ever made. So this is the biochemistry department in, in uh, the University of Ghana, a very beautiful department. And one thing about biochemistry at the time was if you did biochemistry and you still decided that, okay, I want to go back into medicine, I want to do medicine, it was a very easy route to take. So I was like, okay, this is going to be a safe option. And if you did not want to go back into medicine, there were so many opportunities for a biochemist at the time. Uh, so I spent four years in this building and uh, down here on the bottom right panel is the Noguchi Memorial Institute for Medical Research. And uh, this institute was built mainly for research. So we have many labs that study infectious diseases, uh, immunology, you name it. And so I spent most of my four years either in the Department of Biochemistry taking courses or uh, at the Noguchi Memorial Institute uh, during my uh, summer breaks to kind of gain more research experience. So this is where I spent most of my uh, college days. And uh, the way the Ghanaian education system works again is that you don't really get to do research. And that's one thing that I really like about the US system that undergrads are able to do research even from uh, their freshman year. But when I was in college at the time, you could only uh, do research in your final year. So your final two semesters is when you actually uh, get involved in some sort of research. And so uh, that is when I decided that, okay, I want to do something fun. I want to uh, contribute in a way to the cholera endemic that was in Ghana at the time. And so for a lot of people who would not know cholera, it's a gastrointestinal disease and uh, it spreads really quickly. Uh, and, and the way it, it spreads is like, there are environmental isolates, but once it gets into a human, it begins to adopt and new, uh, new phenotypes and becomes more infectious. So the environmental isolates are not as infectious as the clinical isolates. And so I was very young, knew nothing about science and research, uh, but then I wanted to contribute in a way to uh, understanding how uh, this vibro cholerae, which is the bacteria that causes uh, cholera, transforms in, into a hyper infectious state. And so that is me working in a biosafety cabinet. So what I did basically is I would go into the environment and then uh, try to swap some isolates, hoping that I can get uh, the environmental isolates of vibro cholerae. And then I'll also go to the hospital and try to get uh, clinical isolates. And then basically it was such, it was a simple uh, experiment that I did. I'd purify proteins, random manager, try to identify unique uh, bands that are present in clinical isolates, but are absent in environmental isolates with the hopes of isolating those bands, uh, running mass spectrometry analysis on them and trying to identify uh, what those proteins that were getting um, hyper-expressed, what, what they were trying to identify the identity. However, I we did not have the mass spec facility and it was not enough time. So I was still able to do something. These are uh, some of my plates. Uh, so if you have vibro uh, the plate is going to change from green to uh, yellow. And, and these are some of the bands that I was analyzing from the numerous general runs that I had I had done. So very exciting times uh, back then. It was, it was really nice looking back and seeing what I had done in my undergraduate study. Now, these incredible mentors were just amazing. So here is Dr. Samuel Dodu, and I'll be remiss if I don't give him any uh, acknowledgement. So he was my mentor uh, when I was doing my undergraduate uh, research. 
and he was such an amazing mentor. He kept encouraging me that, you know, I think you should pursue research. I think you'd be good at research. You should really consider going to grad school when you're done. Truly amazing man. And I'm still in contact with him. And he, he always, he's always proud of what I'm able to do now. And this is Dr. Samuakusi. So Dr. Samuakusi was one of the people I consulted with when I was graduating from high school and did not know what to do. So he's an immunologist and he's uh, the person who enlightened me about biochemistry and uh, the many opportunities that are available for biochemists. So really grateful uh, that I had him in my life. And here is Dr. Gordon Awandare, who is now the pro, uh, I think he's the provost for the University of Ghana. And at the time, he was the head of department at the Department of Biochemistry. Now, this man is a very well-respected man, very smart, very successful in everything that he does. Very, uh, He's an amazing researcher. And I always got so much inspiration from him. He always encouraged me that you could do it. You could, you could achieve whatever you set your mind to achieve. And uh, he's, he's still my mentor. And, and I'm really proud of uh, where he is now, and I'm sure he is about me too. So that was basically my undergraduate study. And when I completed uh, college, like I said, you have to serve the country for, a, for the country for a year, and that's what I did. So uh, I stayed in the Department of Biochemistry as a research assistant. And here again, you see Dr. Dodu. So Dr. Dodu and I embarked on very exciting projects. So what we did was we would go uh, to local fish farms that were in Ghana and we would isolate, um, we try to isolate bacteria from different organs of the fish and play them on, on, on agar plates, isolate those bacteria and then we send them out. So basically what we were doing was we were trying to identify pathogenic bacteria that were infecting fishes and the idea was that uh, a company that was based in UK would develop emergency vaccines uh, for the local fish farmers. So uh, our part of that whole process was just to isolate and characterize the bacteria, and then they, they do the uh, clinical vaccine, uh, emergency vaccine production. So that was very, very exciting. Uh, but as part of my work, uh, I was working also at the West African Center for Cell Bio biology and infectious pathogens. And uh, one of the jobs that we did was we would go to local high schools because, and, and we would try to talk to them about science, the opportunities in science, the opportunities available for them, try to get them excited about science. And so when I got this message, uh, email from Dr. Sauls to do this again, I was just so happy because this is something that I had already started uh, doing in Ghana. And so this is me, very excited. We we went to, um, uh, 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 it was an Islamic school in Ghana, and we went to talk to them about science, about what we are doing, you know, we are not too different. We are not too old from them. So we tell them what we were doing to help contribute, you know, to solving some of the medical problems that we had in the country. And again, that's me. So very exciting times. I, I, I had really, really great times doing that. But then I also got opportunity to study more about Vibrio cholerae and how it, it it's, uh, impacts uh, health in Ghana. And over here, my work ended up being uh, published in one of the conference uh, proceedings that, that happened in Ghana in 2018. And that's me uh, presenting my research uh, poster. So very exciting times. But something really cool happened when I was in Ghana. So we, we the, at the same conference, we were able to invite a Nobel laureate, Peter Agri. So Peter Agri discovered aquaporins, uh, which is the, the channel for water molecules to go in and out of cells. And he was the most humble man I have ever seen at the time. You know, I was expecting a Nobel laureate to be, you know, shoulder up, like bragging about how smart he is and how cool his science was and everything. But he was the most, most, most humble man. And I was really, really happy that I got to meet him. That's me there and uh, taking a selfie with Peter Agri. 
And in his speech, he always said science was cool because you're allowed to be wrong. You know, you ask a question and you're allowed to be wrong. And at the time, I did not really understand what he was saying. But now I really appreciate those words. And he also talked a lot about uh, fostering collaborations. So he, he gave kind of a story of how he was able to discover aquaporins and how that led to his Nobel Prize. And in all of that, he just kept mentioning how different people had contributed, given uh, acknowledgements to who, who deserves it. And he just kept on, it, it almost felt like he did nothing himself. That's how humble he was. And for me, that was truly inspiring. And I was very grateful to have met him. I had uh, lunch with him and uh, we got to, to learn so much from him. And from there on, I, I knew for sure that research was something that I wanted to pursue and research is something that I want to go into. And so that began my long journey across the North Atlantic Ocean uh, here into the United States. And again, people were very instrumental in that. So here is Professor George Stephen Asante. He was the first head of department for the Department of Biochemistry uh, back in the University of Ghana. So I'd always go into the, dep the department head's office to you know, have conversations, try to learn from them, get advice. And I'd always see his portrait. So you know, seeing Purdue University, he had gone to Purdue University. I was like, OK, Purdue University looks like a good place to go. I started looking into Purdue University and I was amazed at, you know, the amazing resources and, and the infrastructure that is here. And then also I, at the time I got in contact with Dr. Kobe Sarpon. So Dr. Kobe Sarpon at the time was a postdoc at uh, Washington University in St. Louis. And he was very helpful because I would send him all my essays and he would read through and tell me, okay, you need to, you know, highlight this skill that you have more take away this kind of like helping me draft all those essays that you need for grad school application and i'm really grateful that uh, he was there for me at the time when i needed him the most okay so now i'm in the us i had to join a lab and so when i was when i came to ghana i was all about infectious diseases and then drugs and how to design drugs to you know cure infectious diseases that is what i wanted to do um i didn't know a lot about epigenetics which i'll talk to you about in a minute uh but one thing that i really really liked was when you come to the department of biochemistry here at Purdue university your first week you just have professors coming in and telling you about their research and so that is when I met my mentor, uh, Dr. Hime Ragawa. And the excitement she had when she was talking about the research just got me interested because I was like, wow, you know, for somebody to be that much interested in what they are doing must be really cool. And at the time, I didn't really know what epigenetics was, but just her excitement and how she spoke about it and how. Uh, uh, she talked about her research and, and things that were going on in the lab got me really, really uh, excited. And I wanted to pursue that. So that's what I ended up doing. And there were three things that mattered to me in choosing a lab. It was science. It, I have to have a sense of family. And I needed a fun place because science can be hard. And I feel this 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 lab, the Gawa lab, truly encompassed all of those things. And uh, it was it was the best lab for me. Uh, at Purdue. So like I said, when I came into the United States, I had basic knowledge of the central dogma of molecular biology, and I'm sure a lot of people here do. So I knew that DNA can be replicated to make more DNA, it can be transcribed to make RNA, and then the RNA, which contains the information, uh, can be translated. So the information in the RNA can be translated to make a protein. And that in itself was cool. So what I did not know was that there is more to the story, right? So it turns out that this DNA can be modified. So you have like DNA methylation on, on it and that could affect how you know genes are regulated. 
And this DNA is wrapped around these histones. So these uh, uh, protein octamers that that's the DNA is wrapped around to make the nucleosome. The nucleosome, so basically these histones can also have modifications and those modifications can also affect the way genes are expressed. Now these nucleosomes can further be packaged, they can be made more compact to form the chromatin and then the chromatin can also be compacted to make the chromosome, okay? So <clears throat> I thought this was really cool. And I remember when I went into Dr. Gower's office to talk to her about you know, epigenetics and all of that, she just took a piece of paper and started drawing these things out for me. And I, I, I felt like she's such an amazing teacher because you know, taking a piece of paper and going through the individual steps was really, really exciting to me. And this essentially is what epigenetics is about. So you have the DNA, it contains the genetic code, which is the information that is needed to make proteins and all of that, right? But there are other factors that can regulate how this genetic information is utilized without changing the underlying genetic code. And so I thought that was really exciting. Now, another thing that is exciting about this concept is that if you took the chromosome and then you just purify DNA from cells and you stretched it out, it's about two meters long. That's like the size of a king size bed, right? So it's truly amazing that this long information in the form of a king size bed is wrapped so tightly that it can fit into uh, the nucleus of a cell. So it's basically microscopic. You would need a microscope to be able to look into that nucleus, right? But if you purified DNA from that, that's like two meters long. So it was truly amazing how that can be packaged and kept into a nucleus and fit into that nucleus and it's regulated in a way that genes can be turned on and, and turned off. Now, for me, and, and this is where my advice comes in, you have all it takes to be successful, packaged and stored inside of you. Because for me, this is truly, truly, truly amazing that whatever information that you need as a cell to survive has been, you know, a very long, it's, it's just been packaged so nicely, beautifully and put into the nucleus. And I think that applies even on the larger scale to, to a full organism like the human being. Everything you need to be successful is truly in you and you can be whatever you want to be. And, and that's, that's how I, I live my life right now. So now we know this about, about the DNA, how it's compacted, but then there are also other factors that regulate gene expression. And these factors are called transcription factors. And it's funny, it's like the gene would make a transcription factor, which is a protein, which is coming from the gene and it can go on and regulate other genetic uh, regions. So very exciting concept, right? Now, I like to think of transcription factors as traffic lights, right? So a transcription factor can be green and that will turn on gene information or it can be red and it will turn off gene, uh, gene expression, right? So green, turn on gene expression, red, turn off gene expression. And this way, they play very, very crucial roles in regulating uh, what genetic information is utilized. And the reason why that is important is because all of these cell types, all of them contain the same genetic information. So your bone cell, your nerve cell, your muscle cell, your blood cell, all of these cells contain the same set of genetic information. But these cells look different, so they have different structures, and they also have different function. Right, So it is very important that a cell is able to regulate what genetic information to use when becoming a specific cell type. And this is when these transcription factors and uh, epigenetics become very, very important because they work in tandem to regulate uh, what genes that are needed for a specific cell type to be turned on and those that are not needed for that cell type to be turned on. So very exciting. Also, it plays a role in different stages of life from conception all the way down into adulthood and old age. So very, very, very important processes are regulated by, by transcription factors and gene expression and epigenetics. And it, it also plays a role in disease. So when I joined 
Dr. Gallus Lab, one of the things that I was really excited about is this transcription factor uh, that is called VESF1. So VESF1 stands for vascular endothelial zinc finger one. Okay. So it's quite a sizable protein, about 56 kilodaltons, and it binds primarily to poly G sequences. So on the DNA, if you have G, 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 that's a potential site for VESF1 to bind on the DNA. Now, it belongs to a family of proteins, just like we all belong to our own families. Uh, VESF1 also belong uh, to a family of proteins, and proteins in this family are usually known for regulating uh, gene expression in, in development, right? And so sometimes that can give information about what your protein of interest, in my case, VESF1, could be doing. And studies had shown that the loss of VESF1 is associated with diseased human myocardium and decreased cardiac growth in zebrafish. So it plays very crucial roles in, in the cardiovascular uh, development, which, which for me was very exciting. Now, uh, the absence of VSF1 is embryonic lethal. This basically means that uh, if, if you are a developing mouse and you lack VSF1, you will not be able to make it to term so you will not be able to be born as a live mouse, basically, right? And usually when that happens, it means that whatever transcription factor or whatever protein you are looking at is very important for development. And so if you take it away, you, are, you abolish development, essentially. And so here is uh, an E9.5, which is a stage during development. You can see there's an obvious size difference uh, difference between a VSF1 knockout where there is no VSF1 and when there is VSF1. And then in later stages, you begin to see hemorrhage. So uh, these mice are not able to form good vasculature and you begin to see blood scattered all around the embryonic mouse. So basically suggesting that they are not able to make blood vessels and, and stuff like that. So again, an important uh, transcription factor to look at. Uh, for development. So a study looked into the expression pattern of VSF1. So like I said, you know, transcription factors need to be expressed. There are different cell types and they can play different roles based on whatever cell type they are in. So what the study found was they were looking at the, uh, the, the early stage of development, right? So 7.25. What it saw was that the expression of SF1 is localized to the mesoderm, right? So wherever you see blue in this case signifies where SF1 is being expressed. And this is just a zoomed in version. So you can see that in this ectoderm, you don't have any blue uh, stain in there. Whereas you see this blue stain in here in the, in the mesoderm. And this was such a great discovery. And the reason why it's a great discovery is because during development, there is a stage called uh, gastrulation, right? So this at this stage, you form the three germ layers, the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. And so you have the ectoderm going to make cells like your skin, your neurons, and stuff like that. You have the endoderm making things like your lung, your pancreatic cell, but then you have the mesoderm. And remember, this is where the expression of vesiform was found to be localized. And in that mesoderm, you are able to generate basically most of the, cell, the cell types that make up the cardiovascular system. So you have the cardiac muscle, you have the red blood cells, you have the smooth muscle in the gut, you have, and it, it, it even makes the blood vessels as well. So this suggested that VSF1 may be very, very critical in, in the development of uh, mesodermal cell lineages. And at the time, uh, studies had shown that if you knock out VSF1 from cells, they are not able to form blood uh, vessel networks. So here in wild type, you see that the cells are able to make this networks of uh, kind of symbolizing vasculature, making blood vessels. But in the knockout, it's completely abolished. So previous studies had, studies had already shown that VSF1 is critical for making uh, the hemangioblast lineage, right? But we did not know if it plays any role in the cardioblast lineage. And so this is what I was really excited about. I was like, I need to know if VSF1 is required for cardiomyocyte development. 
And so our hypothesis was that the loss of SF1 will impair cardiomyocyte differentiation. And to study this, we used embryonic stem cells as a model system. So embryonic stem cells can self-renew, so they can make more of themselves, but also under the right condition, they can differentiate to make different cell types, right? So here you see that a membranic stem cell can make all three germ layers. It can make the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. And this is exciting. And I have another word of encouragement here. You can become anything you want if you're in the right environment. And we are like stem cells, essentially. If you give the right environment to stem cells, they can really become whatever cell type you need them to be. And I, I believe strongly that that is who we are as a people. If you find the right environment, you can truly become whatever you want to be. If you want to be a great scientist, just be in the environment. Go, go do some research internships, be among scientists. And before you know it, uh, you are a scientist yourself. Okay, so we had a hypothesis, we had a question, but we needed to test it. And so we had to develop a method to test uh, our hypothesis. And so what we did was we developed this method to differentiate embryonic stem cells from their stem state into making cardiomyocytes. So cardiomyocytes would have, they'll be, they'll, these are heart cells, so they'll be beaten, right? That's what makes your heart beat, right? So basically, I don't want to go in detail of what the protocol is, but we do these hanging drops where we take the embryonic stem cells and then we put, we put them in 20 microliter drops, as you can see here, and then fed them on top of the petri plate. So over here at the base of this petri plate would be uh, just liquid PBS uh, to prevent the drops from drying. And this is our way of simulating a 3D uh, culture system for, for the embryonic stem cells to be able to make those gem layers that we are interested in. And also we treat these uh, cells with chair and so chair basically would activate wind signaling. Right after that, we inhibit wind signaling, and then basically we allow the cells grow and, and, and so they give us cardiomyocytes. So this is what it looks like uh, when we, we make cardiomyocytes. Oops. I think I did something. Okay. I'll stop and share again. Okay, sorry about that. So when we differentiate the embryonic stem cells, we are able to make cardiomyocytes with contractile activity. So we are able to see these cells beating on a petri plate and truly, truly exciting. It's always the highlight of my talks wherever I go. So, okay, now we have the system to make cardiomyocytes. What we were interested in is, can we reduce VESF1 expression? Because our hypothesis was the loss of VESF1 would impair cardiomyocyte differentiation. And so we needed to remove cardiomyocyte from, from the embryonic stem cells. And so the way we did that was to use this uh, doxycycline inducible system, where when we treat the cells with doxycycline, doxycycline will bind uh, to, its, uh, to, to the TET protein. I don't want to go into details of that, but basically, that would be able to turn on the expression of, a, of an mRNA, shRNA. So when it turns on the expression of this shRNA, the shRNA would go on and target the mRNA. So the mRNA is the messenger RNA of VESF1. So basically, the cells is producing VESF1, but we are also in produ producing a short RNA that would go and target that RNA that is produced uh, for VESF1 and degrade the RNA so it will take it for uh, degradation. So basically, the mRNA will not be translated into a protein. And what we can do is we can see if that is truly the case. So we can do a Western blot, and a Western blot basically would uh, we, we take protein extracts, and then uh, once we isolate those proteins and quantify them, we run a gel, separate these proteins by size. And then once we transfer it to a membrane, we can use an antibody that is specific uh, to VESF1, and we can begin to detect if VESF1 is present or not. So in the wild time, we have VESF1. In the knockout, where there is no VESF1, you will not see any VESF1 expression. 
And then over here from I1 to I6 is the continuous treatment with doxycycline. And we see that when you keep adding doxycycline to these cells, you are able to reduce their protein levels compared to the wild type and uninduced state. So this was truly, truly uh, a significant milestone in trying to understand whether FSF1 is necessary for cardiomyocyte development. And so uh, what we did then was, now that we knew that our system was working, uh, here's the same protocol that I was showing you, but we knocked down VSF1 two days before we start the differentiation process, all the way through our differentiation. And we can use what we call a quantitative PCR, where we are looking at the RNA levels of VSF1. And we can see that when we treat with doxycycline, we are able to reduce the expression of VSF1 so we are comparing the uh, purple bars to the blue bars. You see that the purple bars, which have been treated with doxycycline, is, is uh, significantly reduced compared to the blue bars, which are not treated with uh, doxycycline. So now that we had our system, we went on to look at the cells going through differentiation to see if a reduction of VSF1 has any impact on cardiomyocyte development. And so here we are looking at day four and day six of cardiomyocyte development. And what we see is that in the no dox treatment, so you've not treated the cells with doxycycline, you have the cells growing. So you can see that the cells are growing very well, making these layers that would eventually become cardiomyocytes. Uh, but that is abolished when you treat the cells with doxycycline. So at day four, you have you don't see uh, that cells, the, the cardiomyocyte progenitor cells growing out of the core of this of this embryo body. And by day six, you begin to see a degradation. So they are dying. They are not able to grow at all, right? So this was the first indication that VSF1 is probably necessary for making cardiomyocytes. And so we went on uh, to look at whether they were able to make cardiomyocytes at day 12. And over here, uh, let me see if I can get this video playing. We are able to make cardiomyocytes uh, in wild type cells, so just basic wild type cells treated with dogs to show that doxycycline is not a problem. They are able to make cardiomyocytes, but in the knockdown cells, they are not able to make cardiomyocytes, which is on the, on the left. So these were not able to make cardiomyocytes, but wild type cells were able to make cardiomyocytes. So again, showing that uh, VSF1 is necessary to promote cardiomyocyte differentiation in these cells. Okay, now that we knew that VSF1 is necessary, our next question was, at what stage of differentiation is VSF1 necessary? And the beauty about a doxycycline inducible system is you can choose when to add doxycycline. So you can choose when to reduce the expression of uh, VSF1 by the treatment of doxycycline. And so here is just a cartoon of how that was uh, designed. So T1 is when we treat it from the beginning of differentiation. T2 is after day two, T3 is after day four, okay? And what I want to show you here is that in the untreated cells, Again, you are able to make those cells that would later on go on to become cardiomyocytes. At T3, when we treat from uh, day four with doxycycline, so we are reducing the expression of uh, VSF1 from day four, you are still able to see that cell outgrowth. But the most stark observation we saw was if we treat from day zero, then we, we the cells basically are not able to form those rings that would go on to become cardiomyocytes. We are able to abolish that. So that suggests to us that the expression of VSF1 before day two, so, and this is where you make the mesoderm. So the expression of VSF1 at this stage is critical for cardiomyocyte development later on. And again, we can do a gene expression analysis to look at the induction of mesodermal genes, which are supposed to go up at day two and see if the treatment of doxycycline, which is T1, impairs that. So over here, we are looking on the uh, y-axis, we are looking at the relative gene expression. 
And so in the wild type, you see that the gene expression goes up and then when we inhibit, it comes down, right? We see it again going up at day two for brachyuri, which is another uh, mesoderma marker, and we see it going up for CDK1. However, when we treat these cells with doxycycline, so where at this stage where there is the presence of doxycycline, which means that we've reduced the vessel one expression, we see that the induction is reduced. So the induction, not, which is the green line uh, of winds, brachyuri, and CDK1 are all reduced compared to the wild type. And again, if we go on to look at cardiomyocyte differentiation, we see that it's we can make cardiomyocytes if we uh, don't treat with doxycycline or if we treat from day four. However, when we treat from day two, we still make some cardiomyocytes, but the most significant observation that we saw is that when we treat from day zero, we are not able to make cardiomyocytes. So these cells do not beat. Right. So that was confirmatory that VSF1 is needed before you make the mesoderm. And again, I just want to emphasize that over here we are treating with chair. So we are increasing wind signaling prior to day two. So that is when we are making uh, the mesoderm ourselves. That would go on to make the cardiomyocytes. And because of that, we, we wanted to ask okay, since we are activating wind signaling here, what is going on with the wind signaling pathway? And again, I have a cool advice here. So the wind signaling pathway, the way it works is that in the off state, beta catenin is released from the, the uh, cell membrane, and then it's phosphorylated, and that phosphorylation leads to proteasoma degradation. So beta catenin is degraded. However, in the presence of a wind ligand, which means the wind signaling system is supposed to be turned on, that the degradative complex here is sequestered to the membrane. So when beta catenin is released, what happens is uh, it can it's no longer degraded, it's not phosphorylated, so it can translocate into the nucleus, while it interacts with other partners like TCF to turn on wind target genes, right? So this is how you turn on the genes that are important for those mesoderma uh, cells development. And so what I'll say is discourage unhealthy competitions in your career to, to, in science and always work in teams. The signaling systems are always working in teams to make sure that they are able to achieve a desired purpose, right? But oftentimes as humans, we, we get worried about competitions and we always want to win for ourselves, but in science, to win, you have to always work in teams and, and, and signaling pathways emulate that very well. Okay, so what did we see? Now, if our hypothesis is that wind signaling is impaired in uh, knockouts or in the absence of vesophon is true, then we don't expect to see vesophon expression inside the nucleus, right? Because it should be degraded, it should not go into the nucleus. However, if the pathway is activated, then beta catenin should be released and it should go into the nucleus. So we can look at the nuclear beta catenin levels and that would give us an idea of whether the wind pathway is activated or, or not. And so over here, there are many things here, but I just want to focus on VESF1. So basically, we see that in the uninduced, we have VESF1 expressed. And when you induce the knockdown, you have reduced levels of VESF1 and in the knockout, you have no VESF1, right? Now, if you look at beta catenin in the nucleus, you see that we have more beta catenin in the anindus where we have VSF1. However, when we have reduced VSF1 expression, we also have reduced uh, beta catenin in the nucleus. So this was truly an exciting piece of data supporting what we had already seen that uh, the wind signaling pathway is being impaired and the mesoderm cells are not being formed properly. And so now that we had this data, we wanted to say, okay, now if beta catenin is being released and it's going into the nucleus, then the beta catenin levels on the nuclear, on the cell membrane should be reduced, right? And in the knockouts where you don't have uh, beta catenin uh, getting into the nucleus, there are two things that could happen. Either it's being degraded or it is 
stuck on the membrane. It's not getting released from the membrane. So we wanted to see what was going on there. We did some immunofluorescence images. And basically what immunofluorescence would do is it would be able to help you visualize where your protein of interest is. And here we have a DAPI stain. So DAPI stain will basically tell you where your nucleus is because it stains the DNA and the yeah. DNA is in the nucleus. And so what we saw with that piece of data is that in the wild type cells, you have reduced beta catenin uh, on the nuclear membranes. Uh, and, and the way we explain that is that this beta catenin is getting into the nucleus and it's turning on gene expression, as we've seen with the Western blood that I showed previously. Uh, we would have to do a better image, a high resolution image to look right into the nucleus to see if we can see a lot of beta catenin there. But this is informative. And in the knockout, you can clearly see that the, the green bands are, are much brighter, right? Indicating that this beta catenin is still on the nuclear periphery and it's not getting released. And so, again, like the way the pathway works is fine. Uh, if beta catenin is stuck to the membrane, it could it could mean that the signal is not coming in for beta catenin to be released, right? And one of the signals that do that is this wind ligand, right? So if we treat the cells with wind ligand, a hypothesis is that that treatment with wind ligand should release beta catenin, and we should be able to re rescue the defects that we see in the vesicular knockout cells. And so over here is, again, a quantitative P uh, PCR where we are looking at gene expression, and uh, that's represented on the y-axis. And then on the x-axis, we are looking at different wind target genes. Yeah. And so what we see is that in the wind 3 gene, for example, in the knockout, you have reduced uh, wind 3 expression. When we treat the knockout with wind, which is this wind ligand here, you are able to rescue it. You are able to see an increase. However, when we inhibit this whole pathway again by including a wind inhibitor, it comes back down to uh, the knockout levels, although we have the wind there. And this effect is even more severe in the brachyurigin T, where you see that in the knockout, it's low. When we treat with wind, we are able to rescue that effect. So it comes, the expression of this T gene comes back up, suggesting that wind is binding to this receptor, releasing uh, beta catenin to go into the nucleus, right? However, when we block this whole pathway with XAV, we're able to bring it again back down to our type levels. And we see that across board, suggesting again that Vesafuan may be important to turn on these ligands that would go on uh, to bind to the receptors and allow for beta catenin to go into the nucleus. And in the Vesafuan knockout, what is happening is we don't have these ligands being expressed properly and they are not binding to the receptor. That is why we still have beta catenin bound to the membrane. And there is data to show for all of that, but I did not want to put too much data here, although I think I already have. But basically, if everything that I've been saying was not very clear, this is a simple model that we have. The model that we have is embryonic stem cells can be differentiated to make mesodermal cells via the increased activation of wind signaling. And that is done through VSF1, right? Because VSF1, again, is a transcription factor. And we have data showing that it binds to this wind signaling ligands uh, to turn on the expression. Now, those mesodermal cells, once they are formed, can go on to make cardiomyocytes. However, in the absence of VSF1, what we see is reduced wind signaling. And that reduced wind signaling impairs mesodermal cell development, and that abolishes cardiomyocyte development. So what my research has been able to show so far is that it's been able to identify the role of VSF1 in promoting proper mesoderm formation. So now we know that from that earlier study where they showed that VSF1 is expressed in, that, in the mesoderm, we now know that it's important for mesodermal lineages. And we also know what it is actually doing in the mesoderm. We know the pathways that is turning on in the mesoderm. And this can help us 
you know, do so many things like tissue regeneration uh, to solve many heart problems and heart diseases that affect the world today. So with that, I'd like to thank my advisor, Dr. Himira Gawa, uh, for giving me the opportunity to pursue this amazing research in her lab and giving me all the advice and criticisms that I need to be successful. I'd also like to thank my thesis committee, uh, Dr. Scott Briggs, Dr. James Forney, Dr. Joaquin Bao. All of them have been instrumental. Uh, they've helped me kind of think properly about my experiments and, and the interpretation of the data that I obtained. So I'm very, very grateful for the amazing work that uh, they've been doing and their support. And also, I, I didn't talk about this, but I have uh, two very, very amazing uh, undergrads, Martin and Hen. Uh, both of them have been very, very instrumental uh, performing experiments. And some of the data that I have shown you here today comes from both of them and funding from uh, the Department of Biochemistry and the American Heart Association. Uh, with that, thank you for your audience. And I am happy to take questions. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Isaiah. That was a great presentation. And really, I don't know how many more questions we have because I think you did you did a good job of filling in the full time <laughs> and telling us a great journey, uh, how you got here and your journey of mentors that you've had in your life and I thank you so much for taking us through that and and thank showing you. us showing us a little glimpse inside your world too and uh, your journey okay. so far. Very exciting. I would ask, you know, what's next for you? Is there is there next steps of things that you want to do? And if you want, you can stop uh, sharing your screen and like that. We'll we'll be face to face again. But. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, any next steps for you that you're planning on taking? Yes, so I I think I really enjoy research. And so I want to stay in academia. I want to one day own my own Mensa lab and do all the cool science that I want to do. Awesome. So my immediate next step would be to take a postdoc position and I'm working on that hopefully by next year. Awesome. And, Awesome. Wow. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, thank you also so much for the mentoring that you did through this video. I think that was great too. Lots of guidance, lots of recommendations. So thank you again. And what a pleasure. I thank hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.